been a long time since we were here together, and so Gettysburg is our topic, as I'm sure you remember. And I, I want to start tonight by seeing if there are things that have occurred to you in this interval that you want to bring up, any leftover things from last time or any nagging um, problems or aggravating statements that you've been mulling over since we last met. Scott, you look like you're assuming the asking a question position. <laughs> Is that correct? I, I do have a question. I got <laughs> I, well, one of the things that I, as like a historian of the Civil War, and you kind of touched on this in the, in the essay you wrote on here, the struggle to like figure out who to believe and who to not believe and how you decipher all these different accounts. And I feel like in, in this book... Which one are you pointing to? Alexander? Yeah. Okay. Versus some of the other things we've read, he has a different perspective on like whether they should have continued the battle on the first day and that he... he he offered the opposite point of view, I thought, than in, in a number of instances than what we've read. And I struggle, especially because a lot of this stuff is written so far after the Civil War, to decipher, like, you know, and particularly you who have studied it more, asking, how do you understand and how do you kind of consolidate the different perspectives? and who's right and you, what actually happened. You, you read a lot of things and play them off against one another and make judgments about which people, which historical actors tend to be reliable and which are liars. And a number of them are just inveterate liars. They lie about everything. He is, he is I told you before everybody else came in, I think he is the single best um, writer about the war among all the people who experienced the war and wrote about it from the Confederate side. And I think on the Union side, the only one who's better than he is is U.S. Grant. U.S. Grant and Porter Alexander are the two best memoirs, military memoirs, of the Civil War. He wrote another book, as you know, if you read the introduction in here carefully, that he published in 1907, <coughs> Alexander did, called Military Memoirs of a Confederate. It's so good that it has never been out of print. It's 113 years later, that book's never gone out of print. He wrote this one, however, before he wrote Military Memoirs, and Military Memoirs has a misleading title because it isn't a memoir, it's really a history of the Army of Northern Virginia. He wrote this one first, wrote it only for his children, which gives it a, a tone that simply is almost never present in a memoir. As you know, he's very hard on Robert E. Lee in various places in there. Almost no former Confederates were hard on him. He's very hard on Stonewall Jackson. He quotes profanity. He quotes instances of cowardice. He's absolutely upfront about Confederate soldiers who killed black soldiers who tried to surrender at the Battle of the Crater. He's ma very matter of fact. They killed them. They, came, they heard there were black soldiers. They came from way down at the other end of the line so they could kill one of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing book in many ways, and it was a revelation to me, not only to me, but to people who knew Alexander well and knew the literature very well. I, I think that has become the single most quoted book on Lee's army by anyone who was in Lee's army. And it's just because he's, I've been able to check lots of things over the years, his descriptions and so forth, and it, he, it, he's amazingly accurate. He was an engineer, he's really smart, he's obnoxiously smart can tell by reading this that he was a pain to a lot of people because he was smarter than they were and they knew he was smarter than they were, one of, one of those kinds of people. We all know those people. We may be those people, but anyway, he's one of those people. And he had, the, there's a description in there of a place on the North Anna River. He was at that place one time for 30 minutes in his life. And he described how the Federals started to shell that position and how the House had uh, recessed windows he said they thought they were about a foot, and he jumped up in one of the windows and pressed himself against that as the shells came in, and one of the Union shells hit a chimney that was up to, to his left and destroyed part of it. And we took a tour there, this has been 15 years ago now, got to that house, and it's exactly as he described it. Recessed windows, a chimney with a repair on the top of it, right to the top left of the window, which was on the side of the house where he said he was. It's just astonishing uh, what his memory was like. But he also had a diary that helped 
jog his memory, and he had letters that he'd written during the war that he also used when he wrote this. So it's a it's an amazing account. That doesn't mean it's infallible, and it doesn't mean there's no second guessing. There's always second guessing in a memoir. Even more generally, I mean, it talks about uh, in in the the other book about how even in the war council with Mead, like there, all the different people who were there and have firsthand accounts have dip, recount like the whether. Uh, Me had reservations about, the and they don't thing. all agree. Yeah. And if, and if, if three weeks from now, somebody looked all of us up and asked us to give them an account of this class meeting, there would be many things that would be difficult to reconcile. We would, you're all going to have very different memories of of what goes on in here. You hear different things, you process different things differently. And you'll just have different memories. So I think I'm very suspicious of oral histories as a category of evidence. They, they're very much used now, and they're going to be used more and more because people don't write letters anymore. And they try to destroy email, even though they really can't, but they get it beyond the reach of historians. Uh, so it's going to be a real problem, I think, an even bigger problem than it has been in the past. Yes, and it's even worse because... If we were sharing our view of this class, we wouldn't have an agenda. Oh, you might have an agenda. We, we might. But Everybody not, has an agenda. I know, but not, <laughs> not compared to people who are trying to justify. Well, not compared to people whose reputations are on the line. Yes. That's right. Not compared to Daniel Sickles arguing with George Gordon Meade about what went on on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. No, they have a lot riding they on that. They have a lot that. riding on that. They have a lot riding on that. Yes. So... I think kind of the different way that Lee and me just are treated is really interesting. And it seems like Lee gets away with making a lot of mistakes and everybody forgives him and his reputation is still really strong. And it seems all of Mead's successes are kind of characterized as not uh, sort of good luck. Or you good mean fortune. his successes at Gettysburg? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good kind of good fortune. And I, is it, does Lee get away with it because of the charisma, because of, I, I, I guess, I want to know what you think the answer to your own question is. That was the one thing I could come up with, and also maybe Longstreet just going on such a tirade <coughs> after Gettysburg probably helped Lee out in a huge way, but... It, it did. It, I think if we could bring Meade and Lee into this room and have them here, they would leave, and then we would talk about them, and you would have a very different impression of Lee than you did of Meade. No matter what you thought, and you might have an impression going in, by the time they left, I think you would, uh, Lee was is just one of those people who commanded spaces and impressed people, even people who didn't especially think they wanted to like him. Meade was grumpy, and he doesn't have a lot of successes overall in his career. I mean, Lee comes into Gettysburg with this resume with a number of really quite spectacular successes on it, almost all against the odds. And Meade doesn't have that on his resume, never has that on his resume, and has the bad fortune about a year after Gettysburg to find himself traveling. He's still the commander of the army, but Grant is traveling with the army. And so it's not Meade's army, it's Grant's army. If anything good happens, it's Grant's army. If anything bad happens, it could be Meade's army. Also, but in your view, do you think that uh, Lee would do something like me did to Chamberlain, like give him like 120 men and just like... Uh, well, Meade didn't do that to Chamberlain. Wasn't Underlings it? did it. I mean, it, it happened. It was way down the chain of command. It was the brigade commander who told Chamberlain, a guy named Strong Vincent, and you'll see his little marker where he was mortally wounded. Strong Vincent told Joshua Chamberlain. Strong Vincent commanded this brigade, and... Uh, in the 5th Corps, and Joshua Chamberlain's main regiment was one of the regiments in that. When you walk along Little Round Top when you're there, they're the main regiment, then there's an 83rd Pennsylvania, and there's a Michigan regiment and a New York regiment. Those are the four regiments in that brigade, and it just so happened that Chamberlain ended up on the left. But the, of course, you mean, would, would Lee put soldiers in, in a position like that? Yeah. Just like that. <laughs> okay. He would. Just absolutely like that. Yep. Yep. You say, though, that Meade has, like, nothing like what Lee has on his resume, but he was the commander of the Army when the, the Union won the biggest battle of the war. So isn't that a huge resume building? No, because it's Grant's Army in everybody's mind. Because U.S. Grant is with that Army the entire way. 
uh, once he gets east, which is to say the only battle where George Meade is really the commander of the Army of the Potomac is this one. But it's a big one. But it is a big one. It's a really big one. And it's a big one that left Abraham Lincoln with what idea about Meade? Did he let Lee get away? He, didn't finish the job. he had a chance to really finish the job, and he didn't do it. Didn't do it. Immensely frustrated by this. Once Grant comes, Meade is part of the... Uh, I, and I think Meade was a good soldier. Don't get me wrong. I, but Meade is not the soldier who can win the war for the United States. I, I mean, there's not the slightest chance that he could have been the soldier who won the war for the United States. He just doesn't, just doesn't have it. Why do you think he was so... And, and I, 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 I was surprised by the, the essay on Meade in here because he's like touted as this great... It's a very positive essay It's very about positive, it. but when you read it, there, he doesn't do that much. He just like repositions some people and gets a lot of credit for that. But obviously, clearly Sowers is... He's is, very good at repositioning. <laughs> yeah. I know, I, you know, that sounded so snarky. <laughs> he actually was good at repositioning, and that is important. We'll talk, I mean, this is, yeah, so we'll talk about that. What's your bottom, I, I, is there a, if you got a bottom line to this particular set of comments? Well, at first I was trying to, de I was trying to defend the point that Meade had nothing on his resume because... Well, coming into Gettysburg, here's Meade's resume. He was a pretty good division commander. He commanded the Pennsylvania Reserves. He commanded the division at Antietam. Then he's promoted to corps commander. He's a corps commander at Chancellorsville, but he doesn't really do anything. He was still a division commander at Fredericksburg, and his guys got shot just like everybody else's. He did okay, but he didn't really stand out. So he's an okay corps commander. He was a pretty good division commander, and he's an army commander who's been in command for three days. That's a pretty blank resume, I think for someone who's in our, and, and in contrast, Lee has the seven days, second bull run, the Maryland campaign, Fredericksburg, and Chancellorsville on his resume. Vastly different. Maybe back to Kara's question a little to Scott's. Um, does the difference between what, how Lee and how Meade are perceived, does a, maybe does some of that stem from their, just their different leadership styles as well? The fact that it does seem like pretty consistently Lee is the central figure, right? He's, he's he the figurehead. He's yeah. the idol. All all decisions flow to him. He has a very small staff. And, Much too small. Right, and admittedly. And and at the same time, Meade is having councils and group discussions and votes about what should be done. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that distributive form of power, just that kind of a distributive power structure, if maybe that also leads, because it, it makes it easy for Meade's critics to look at him and say, oh, he didn't decide anything. The group did, yeah. right? Um, but at the same time, in my mind, it seems like that actually might be a more effective more effective. Well, that was so one of the right. questions that I wanted to talk about. I wanted to do it last, but I don't care how we do this. We'll get to lots of things tonight. And since this is supposed to be a more free-form evening, we can do just exactly whatever you want to do as long as you don't get wildly out of control. All the time. <laughs> but if we want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about that. They have very different leadership styles. Lee can make a decision. Lee doesn't need votes to decide what he's going to He talks to people, talks to Longstreet every day, and we'll do more of this next week talking about the subordinates. He goes and talks to Ewell and his subordinates on the night of the first. He talks to Ewell again that night. He's worried about Ewell. He's already figuring out that Ewell is not Stonewall Jackson, which he didn't know before. Now he's figuring that out. But he never says, let's vote. He never says, let's all get in the room and vote. He does not, he does not need to do that. But Meade, certainly you can have some sympathy for Meade in this situation, having been in command for three days and never been an army commander before. He's junior to some of the, to some of the other corps commanders. He isn't even the senior corps commander. He's junior to John Reynolds. He's junior to John Sedgwick. He's not even the senior corps commander in the Army. And people in the Army are very meticulous about rank during the Civil War and even now. But then they certainly were. And if I'm a major general and Bryce is a major general, but I was a major general a month before Bryce, I'm not going to be entirely comfortable if Bryce is put in charge of me because I rank him. And that's the case with me at Gettysburg. 
He has two of his subordinates who are senior to him in the army. Justin? Well, I was going to say, isn't it somewhat telling as well the one time that he did poll that he wanted to kind of back away to reposition? And was it all the corps commanders who wanted to stay? All the ones who were awake, yes. And, and one was asleep and one didn't vote. But yes, all those who voted. But what is the point? This essay, this favorable essay to him, what's the point that he makes in that essay? That's a decision that people have pointed to many times to show that Meade just can't. Meade has to get, he needs a consensus. He needs to find out what everybody wants to do. What's the essay say about that? I thought it said he didn't do that. He said he'd already made up his mind yeah. Yeah. to stay before he asked for the vote. What he hadn't made up his mind about was whether to remain on the defensive or to attack the next day. But he'd already made the decision and already sent a message to the War Department about his intention to stay. So he'd made one decision without talking to But, of course, that raises the question, what if, what if six of the nine people in the room had said, well, we think we need to go. We don't think we should stay. Then I, I think George Meade might not have stayed. Who knows? We can't know about that, but I think that... Luis? I guess, uh, so, back to Bryce's point, in this specific battle, which is a big one, isn't better this kind of leadership style because you have so many battle fronts and then you can, instead of like waiting the guy on the horse to come to talk yeah. to you and send another decision, like everybody just decide by themselves and, you know, you, you keep um, on a faster speed than the enemy because it's so centralized, they cannot go as fast as you can. No, because, no, and that's, so that's smart. So he brings everybody in and he asks, Hancock, what's going on on your part of the line? And he asked Warren, what's go what have you seen? I mean, and everybody can tell him, bring their intelligence from the very parts of the line. Sure, that's, I would think that's a smart thing to do. That's a smart thing to do. And yeah, for the next day to plan as well, and, and again, for the same day battles. But once the battle starts, then of course it becomes very difficult because communication is so problematical on a Civil War battlefield, really problematical. You want to send a message to Hancock, and you, so you get your staff officer, Scott, and sort of point him in the direction of where you think Hancock is supposed to be, and, he's not there. and he goes, and well, Hancock has gone over to talk to somebody else, so he's not there, or Scott gets shot on the way over, or he gets lost, or his horse gets shot. I mean, anything, it, it's really, really difficult to maintain what we would consider reasonable control of a battlefield when you're talking about there are 160,000 men on that battlefield within a few miles of one another. Chase? Yeah, that was a question I had reading the, the Three Days of Gettysburg book. They, they talk on the first day a lot about Lee was the one that could have exerted influence. Yeah, I actually talked about that, but you're being kind. Well, yeah. I'm just a little curious. <laughs> well, but how much the communication of the time, I mean, how much influence can he exert on this battle? Well, here's the influence he can exert on the first day. Okay. What, did, what did Lee want? To, what are Lee's orders to his army? What, what's the situation on the first day? Is Lee is riding toward Gettysburg that morning of July 1st. Anybody? Jeff? Avoid a big engagement. He has ordered the, his lieutenants not to bring on a general engagement. Why? His whole army isn't up yet. Longstreet and Pickett are still His there. army's all over southern Pennsylvania. He wants them back together. It's the same thing happened to him during the Maryland campaign. His army was scattered over all over Maryland, and he was pushed into a fight. So here he wants the army back together before he gets into a fight. Those are the instructions the night before. So what happens in the morning? <laughs> Jay? He's looking for shoes. A.P. Hill tells Henry Heath he can walk into Gettysburg and look for shoes. Who is not doing his job right there? What, what is, what's the missing component here? Jeb Stewart. If Jeb Stewart had been there with the cavalry, Lee would have known there were Federals in Gettysburg, he would have known, and Henry Heath would not have walked into Gettysburg with his big clunking division. Uh, which is not what big clunking divisions of infantry do. You don't line 7,000 guys up on the road, four abreast, and walk towards something you're not sure about. But that's what, was, that's what happened. Justin? Well, I guess what was the definition, though, of general engagement in terms of, so in my mind, and the reading kind of seems to lead this was, you know, heavy reconnaissance. This was, you know, there's some engagement, but it wasn't 
the full-on armies colliding. Well, what happens when you start shooting at each other? Well, it depends on who, how many are shooting at each it other. It does, doesn't sure it? But, <laughs> but, but let me reframe my question. What can happen when you, if you have an infantry division that starts shooting at other people, that can easily turn into a general. I mean, the best way not to bring on a general engagement is don't go start shooting at somebody. If you're an infantry division, right. let your cavalry sort of do what cavalry do, and don't send an infantry division forward. And so by the time, so Lee hears this firing in the direction of Gettysburg and decides to go take a look. So he gets there, do any of you remember about when he got there? About 2 o'clock. About 2 o'clock he shows up on her ridge. You'll see her ridge when you get there. It's one ridge over from McPherson's ridge. So here comes Lee. Here's Gettysburg. Here's her ridge, McPherson's ridge, Seminary Ridge, Oak Hill, and Cemetery Hill, and Culp's Hill. Wildly out of proportion, but generally. The, so Lee shows up here at 2. What has gone on? down to that point in the day. What's the situation when he gets there? Can anybody give us a quick account? 25 seconds? What's happened? Heath's moving in on this road. He comes in on the Chambersburg Pike, modern Route 30, with his 7,000 infantry. And he gets this far. He gets to her ridge. And he runs into Buford's cavalry, which is here and on McPherson's ridge and the cavalry make Heath deploy, which takes a, takes a long time to get 7,000 men from being four abreast walking along a road to in to battle lines like this. So you go for, it's called from going, you're in column on the road, and you go into line, into a battle formation. It takes an hour for Heath to do that. Then they fight here, and, it's a, and the battle is on an east-west axis. We've talked about all of this. The cavalry fights about an hour, and then John Reynolds comes up with the First Corps. And then it becomes an infantry fight. Justin, this is why it's, you don't want your infantry walking along Pennsylvania and running into somebody. Now you have an entire infantry corps fighting a Confederate division. Now you've got 15,000 guys, 17,000 guys shooting at each other. That's getting very close to being a general engagement uh, already. But you get a stalemate here because the Federals are in a good position on McPherson's Ridge. You'll see that ground. It's very good ground. The Confederates are on <coughs> her ridge. But just before Lee gets on the battlefield, Robert Rhodes' division of Richard Ewell's Corps shows up on Oak Hill. And when you stand on Oak Hill, it's a stunning aspect from Oak Hill. The Union battle line is, is like this, facing that way. Confederate artillery on Oak Hill, and they're looking right down the whole Union line. It's an artillerist's dream. You can't miss. If you shoot a little bit short, you'll hit Federals here. If you shoot a little bit long, you'll hit Federals here. You'd have to be an absolute dope not to hit Federals somewhere if you're an artillerist up here where they come in. Then Confederate infantry shows up here, and that reorients the entire battle. Now the Federals have to bring the 11th Corps, they bring the 11th Corps out here, and part of the 1st Corps now has to switch and face that way. Now it's a battle that has a north-south axis and an east-west axis, and when Lee gets here, what he sees is the Confederates, it's sheer luck as we talked about last time, they're coming in at exactly the right place. Every time the Federals get a battle line in place, Confederates come in beyond their line. And so Lee sees that, and he is the one who makes the decision here. He says, push it. So he has changed his orders at that point. Don't bring on a general engagement. Oh, wait a minute. This general engagement looks like it's really going our way. And so here, his combative, aggressive side comes out, and he says, push it. So that's a key decision for him to make. But he makes it on the basis of what he can actually see from there. He can see the elements coming together. Tactically, that makes sense. Luis, your arm went up again. Add to that. So he didn't see a retreat, right? He what? Retreat. Or like, doesn't get into engagement can mean many things. He said, no, don't fight at all. Like, don't retreat if, if you need to. Yeah, not so much retreat. Well, yes. And what had happened the very, 
the, the day before, this big brigade under the bright North Carolinian we talked about, James Johnston Pettigrew, he had taken his brigade just the way Heath went in on the first. Pettigrew did it on the 30th. He saw Union cavalry, and what did he do? He immediately withdrew because his orders were not to bring on a general engagement. That's the other reaction. That is the reaction that, that our, that reaction is the one that Lee's orders make pretty clear to anybody who has a uniform on is the desired reaction. Do not start a fight. Because once you start a fight, anything can happen. Anything can happen. So Pettigrew hadn't started a fight the day before. Heath gets into a fight here, but by the time Lee gets there too, these elements are coming together, and it seems to make sense to let the, let the, let the fighting go. Yes? So Stuart wasn't there, which is a problem. I know in other battles they used hot air balloons. Day one yeah. might have been a no little hot air balloons here. for that. Okay. Confederates. <laughs> Porter Alexander talks about the only instance in the entire war where the Confederates use a hot air balloon. It's during the, the Peninsula Campaign, and it became unmoored and just floated down the James. The, the, the Federals have a balloon core, sort of, under a man named Thaddeus Lowe, who uh, had balloons up during the Seven Days, balloons up at Fredericksburg. They're very unwieldy. And in a really active campaign like this, the odds would be against having them move with the army. And Lowe fell out with the government. The government was paying him so much to be a balloon guy. He wasn't in the army. Then they, they said, we're only going to pay you half as much. And he said, well, go to hell. I'm going to California. And, and that's he ended up out in Pasadena. And Mount Lowe out there is named after Lowe. So they have balloonists. But balloonists are on only a handful of battlefields in the Civil War. They worked. You could get up, see everything. They'd run a telegraph wire up. And so the balloonists are up there tapping out what they can see down below. And the other side is trying to shoot them down. They dig holes, put the trails of the cannons in so they can get more elevation and try to shoot them down. But they, they don't play a crucial role on any battlefield. Okay. So Stuart's absence that we talked about last week, I feel like, um, I think it was three days in Gettysburg, kind of offers him some excuses and turns it on Lee. Alan Nolan does, because Alan Nolan wants all of it on Lee. So how does he let Stuart off the hook? He says that Lee gives him contradicting orders and that he wants him to protect the right flank, but he also, uh, you yeah. know, I was hoping you would explain <laughs> a little bit I, I, you know what my feelings are about I this. Uh, I, I don't think you can let Stuart off the hook because Stuart knew what his job was. There's absolutely no question that he knew what his job was. His job was to screen the Army's movement as it went north and gather intelligence about the Federals. That's what his job is. He's really good at it. Really good at it. But he wasn't really good at it here. And Alan who was the lawyer, uh, a really good lawyer. Alan was the senior partner in the biggest law firm in Indiana and was on the Harvard Law Review. And he writes and thinks like a lawyer, which means he doesn't know how to use evidence. Uh, because <laughs> lawyers, here's how lawyers use evidence. I want to argue A. I've got 30 pieces of evidence. 11 of them support A. 19 of them support B, but I don't want to argue B. So I'm going to use my 11 pieces of evidence and argue A. That's how you win cases in a court. You don't have to tell about the 19 pieces of evidence to the jury, but if you're a historian and you've got 30 pieces of evidence and two-thirds of them say B, not A, you have to think pretty hard about arguing A if you're a historian, not if you're a lawyer. Alan and I have many great discussions fueled by he liked really good scotch uh, and cigars. And we would argue about this. And he'd say, no, historians don't know how to use evidence. And I'd say, you know, really, Alan, come to terms with this. But anyway, <laughs> that, is, that is how he makes his case against Lee. What's the gist of Alan Nolan's case against Lee? What, is Alan, what really gets under Alan's skin about Stuart Lee? Stuart left some cavalry for him? In a broader sense. Oh, no, he did. Stuart did leave cavalry. He did leave cavalry. You're running a company, all of you. You've got six key subordinates. You've got A, who's really wonderful. You've got B, who's mighty damn good. You've got C, who's almost mighty damn good. 
You've got D, who's a complete pain in the ass and can't get along with anybody else, but he's pretty good at what he does. You've got E, who should be sent to Siberia and kept away from wars. And you've got F, who is worse than E. Jeb Stewart takes these three with him and leaves those three with Lee. So yes, he does leave cavalry with Lee. And these two are cavalry who would fit into the bar scene in Star Wars. This one is good, but he can't get along with anybody. So it's true that he leaves cavalry. That's true. But it's not cavalry that's very good. And so if you have, if you have a really critical operation, you've got three really good underlings, and three who are not really very good, and you decide these are the ones you're going to let. It's just, to me, that's not a close call. Well, just to push back at that, though, it wasn't that they failed at Gettysburg, these three, you know, D through F. It's that they weren't even there. I mean, why would you leave? Well, the best one, the best one, D, and I'll put a name on him. His name is William E. Jones, and his nickname was Grumble. That's his actual <laughs> nickname. He was known as Grumble Jones in the Army. Grumble Jones was left basically watching the rear echelons of the army, which is an important place for him to be. The other two guys, Beverly Robertson, who was a North Carolinian who should have been court-martialed uh, before, just before the campaign started, and the other was a guy named Albert Jenkins, who commanded this cavalry from the western part of Virginia that was just unspeakably unreliable. They're the ones who are closest to what's going on with the army. So it's, and Jeb Stewart has Wade Hampton, and Fitzhugh, and he's got his best, Fitz Lee, he's got his very best people with him up by uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, on the 1st of July. They're just, they're no, but the main thing, the main thing, as I said before, it isn't even which subordinates are or aren't there. The main thing is that Jeb Stewart, he's the key, he's the one, he's the guy, he's in charge of this. So, should Lee have given him that responsibility? Of course he should, because he's never let him down. He's been a superb cavalry officer. Even though it's, he's been superb as long as Lee is really He's been there ever since Lee's been in the Army. Jeb Stewart has been there right from the beginning and has been absolutely reliable. Just as reliable, just the way Longstreet has. Nothing prepared Lee for how Longstreet behaved at Gettysburg. Nothing prepared Lee, in contrast to Ewell, whom Lee didn't know very much about, he knows about Stewart. Stewart is an absolutely known quantity. To Lee, and so is Longstreet. Sorry, I didn't get what are you trying to get like with the cavalry. I mean, how could Stewart decide which cavalry he would take, and did he need? That? Well, because Lee Lee's style of command, we talked about this before. It's a very it's a very loose rein that he uh, exercises over these people he really trusts. He tells Stewart what he wants him to do, and then quits worrying about it and just assumes that Stuart will do it, because Stuart has always done it before. So Stuart, what Lee didn't know is that Stuart was going to take these three brigades and ride off to the east and end up out of contact with the army through the absolutely critical part of the campaign. There was no way he could have anticipated that. No way. And, and in, for his task, did he need the best cavalry? Or Lee? No, Stuart. Stuart? Was it necessary or? Or no, you could have performance. Well, if any of us, I mean, if we had been, if I were Jeb Stewart, I would have taken those guys too. Mm -hmm. And so would any of you, because they're the people you rely on the most. The, 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 it's not their fault. It's not his subordinates. It's Stewart's no, fault. I mean, yeah, I yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. I would have taken the best ones. He did not think he was going to, he didn't think that he was leaving Lee in the hands of these other cavalrymen. Stewart did not think that. Stewart thought he was going to be doing what he was supposed to be doing. He didn't know the army, the Potomac, was going to start moving with him on the other side of it. <laughs> and there they go. It's stuck. Bryce? But wasn't that part of, was it Nolan's? I think it was Nolan that, that was arguing that wasn't that part of the breakdown was that Lee had given Stuart so many orders, like three or four different directives. That's what that, Alan that, that argues, that poor Jeb would have just been confused yeah, about what I was supposed to do. Yeah, how could I possibly defend and screen and gather resources and swing around the army, but not too far, but not too close. We did not tell him to swing around the Union Army. Well, that, but that's a big okay. They, they told me did not tell him to swing around the Union Army. That's Jeb Stewart's decision. Okay. That that would 
I don't think there, I think it, he thought he was going to retrieve the reputation that had taken a blow at Brandy Station, where Stuart almost lost the biggest cavalry battle of the, of the war. After he'd been in his peacockian best of having big reviews and balls <coughs> at night and having everybody come and look at how wonderful he was, all of those things, and then he was almost defeated and he was humiliated. But is it reasonable to expect that he could have been confused by having <coughs> what seemed to be contradictory orders? You know what I think he would have said if he was confused? He would have said, General Lee, I'm not quite sure what you want me to do here. Please clarify. That's all he would have had to do if he would. I don't think he was confused. But if he were confused, that's what you would do. That's what anybody would do. Let me just make sure, this is what you want me to do. That's all it would have taken. They're together. They're, they're in the same place. He can just go to Lee's tent and say, may I have five minutes with the general? I have one thing I would like to clarify with him. That's all he would have had to do. Can I? Then my question is, when he's dealing with someone like Ewell, who was not a known quantity, who is completely paralyzed by... But, yes, we know that. Right. He didn't know that. Right, so that's so that then that's the question is how does he deal with someone like that, you know, in in a big confrontation like Gettysburg to say, you know, it in the case that you are gonna be paralyzed by my lack of How did Lee when, when did Lee begin to have his real doubts about Yule? Karen? When he said that he should take it if practicable and he it's that evening, I think, that Lee began to think, uh-oh, this isn't, okay, it's not Stonewall Jackson, and I better go see just how far from Stonewall Jackson this is. So he rode over to Ewell's headquarters that night, and what did he find when he got there? When he let them know that he wanted to maintain the aggressive the next day, what was the reaction at, at Ewell's? It's Ewell and Jubal Early, who's a division commander, and Robert Rhodes, who's a division commander, those are the main people in place there. What's their response? Their response is? Just to pass, they try to pass the buck to see. We don't want to be the main part of this offensive. Why don't you let somebody else be the main part and we'll, we'll play a secondary role. That isn't what Lee wanted to hear from them. Not what he wanted to hear in that room. And not what he would have heard from, I hate to say it again, Stonewall Jackson. It isn't what he would have heard from Stonewall Jackson. And it's not what he would have heard from Longstreet in most instances either. He's going to get, Lee's going to get a number of little wake-up calls on July 1st at Gettysburg. He's already had one about Stewart. Then he gets one about Ewell. He gets one about Longstreet when they have their first sort of tense conversation in the afternoon. Brian? Yeah, kind of on that, um, I thought one more interesting passages was Crick talking about the leading causes of uh, Southern defeatists, first, Stewart's absence, second, um, I guess, Ewell's incompetence, right. third, Longstreet's he puts on street. incompetence. Right. Do you agree with that? Kind of I, you know, I think Stewart is in a separate category because if Stewart's, th there wouldn't even have been a battle if Stewart had been doing what Stewart was supposed to do. Once they're on the battlefield, I think, I think Longstreet is more culpable. I think poor Ewell had reasons for not attacking late in the afternoon, and he knew things that Lee didn't know. He said he would attack if A.P. Hill supported him on the right. Lee was literally with A.P. Hill when he got that word from Ewell, and Lee never told A.P. Hill to attack. Which seems, that seems odd to me, that Lee would sort of not have Hill attack, but would expect Ewell to attack. And it seems reasonable to, to want a coordinated attack. So I, I think Lee is culpable there, and I don't know, he never explained why. He didn't tell Hill to attack. Hill had one division that hadn't fired a single shot. His biggest division hadn't even been in the action yet, commanded by a guy named Anderson from South Carolina. Hadn't even been in the fight. So I don't know what's going on with Lee there. That, to me, is inexplicable. But boy, did he, he put a black mark next to Ewell's name metaphorically at that point and it and it never got erased it only then he put out more but this is the first one that night first he didn't attack then he didn't seem aggressive when lee went and talked to him lee what lee it's if you're one of his subordinates you might not always succeed but he would want you to be aggressive 
and want to succeed and want to harm the enemy. If he doesn't get that kind of vibe from you, it's not good for you in terms of how he's going to think about you. I can't remember what other talked about it, but he basically said that Lee was on the field. He was with Hill. He was with you all at some, to some extent. I said that. Oh. <laughs> well, so you said. And so, I did. So at, at some point, I feel like if this were like a business, and your CFO and your CIO and your CMO yeah. are not doing well. It's going to be the CEO that takes responsibility, takes the fall. I agree so completely. I don't understand why, unless it is like what Karen said, that it's just all charisma. At some point, I would imagine it goes up to the top, except Lee escapes all culpability. And it seems like his commanders are the scapegoats. Maybe. He, other people made everyone but Lee the scapegoats at Gettysburg. And I think there's plenty of blame to pass around, but you can't. Lee doesn't get a pass here. He is the one, and he is on the scene with Hill. He's right there. So that is in. He is, he's the one who decides to make it a big battle. Hill doesn't decide to make it a big battle. Lee decides to make it a big battle when he's on the scene. And then he decides not to do something else with Hill. He's, once he gets, once he rides Traveler up off the Chambersburg Pike onto her ridge, it is his battle. Down till then, you can point to lots of people. Why did Hill let Heath go in? Why did Heath do that? Where's Jeb Stewart? Once Lee is there, and the chalk is smacking all over the ground, <laughs> then he's the, he, the, I agree with you completely. The responsibility is on his shoulders. Absolutely on his shoulders. Then his defenders would say, well, Lee wanted to do this, and his, and his subordinates let him down. Or he hoped they would do this, and they didn't do that. And he... But he is in charge once he gets to the field at 2 o'clock. I agree. Wasn't that part of what Nolan's argument was about Lee, that he was, in his official communications, a little bit disingenuous about what happened? And that, or maybe not disingenuous, but he put it in an air that he was trying to get certain things done, but uh, trying to be defensive, if, if at all possible, that he was forced into this. And ultimately, I guess, passing a little bit of the buck in terms of the fact that it was his decision to make. Well, I, I actually, no, I don't think Lee, I think one of the things I think is admirable about Lee is that he does take responsibility. He took responsibility in a letter to Jefferson Davis right after he said, I'm, I, it's my fault. I asked the troops to do more than they can do. It's my fault. Now, he, in his post-war conversations, which he didn't think would ever become published, <laughs> and which did eventually become published, he, he had a hierarchy of blame. And he did blame Jeb Stewart. And he was hard on, he lumped all his corps commanders together. He said they fought the battle in a halting way. And it's clear Ewell would be at the top of that list. But, but Hill, he was unhappy with Hill and Longstreet as well. So yes, he does point the finger at people, but he doesn't in his official report. And he doesn't publicly. And he didn't with his own men right after the battle. He rode right out among them. You'll walk out on that part of the field and said, "This is all my. It's all my fault. It's not. It's all my fault. Not it's mostly my fault, or it's our fault. It's my fault." He said. Um, so the also thinking on Lee and go, going to this point that um, was also he complaining a lot about not having commanders or generals to, to work with him or something. Uh, but that he was already in the war for a while, so isn't his also his fault that he didn't develop other um, coronels or general brigades, because you know he knew the size he was getting and he knew he wanted to spread out and have more uh, like uh, corps, but he didn't do well bringing up more, more officers, right? Well, here's the, here's, we talked about this problem before, and when you're all running high-powered country uh, companies, you'll probably <laughs> find this out too. It's hard to be certain that somebody who's done very well at this level is going to do very well at this level. You just can't tell. Sometimes they do, sometimes they're spectacular, sometimes they end up with your job. But can, but, can you try on the field somehow and well, test it? He's trying. This is their first battle since Stonewall Jackson died. So this is the very first time that his two unknown quantities are going to be Corps commanders, Hill and Ewell. They've never commanded this many men before. It's new for them. This is their first time at bat. 
at that level of command. So no, he has no record to go on there. No record to go well, on. There's no other way to try them out or to send you. There's no other way, right? Well, the other way to try them out is they command at the next lowest level. He's not going to tell Stonewall Jackson, take a battle off. I want to see how Hill does uh, as a corps commander. No. If Stonewall Jackson's there, Stonewall Jackson's in charge. It's a, it's a brutal uh, process in the Civil War. When do you have to replace someone, usually someone who's any good, when they're killed? That's when you have to do it. So Jackson is dead. What are we going to do? One of the key decisions that Lee made right after Jackson died is the army had always been in two pieces. Jackson had half of it and Longstreet had half of it. Lee decided that he probably shouldn't trust anyone else with that much, so he, made, he cut it into three pieces instead of two. And so whereas Jackson and Longstreet had each had a corps with four divisions in it, that's the old army in Northern Virginia, eight divisions in two corps. When they create the new third corps, they take that division goes there, that division goes there, and they bring a new division into the army. So it is, so now James Longstreet's corps is smaller than it was before. Richard Ewell got a smaller version of the corps that, that Jackson had commanded, and A.P. Hill got a brand new corps that had his old division in it, which came out of Jackson's corps, plus one division from Longstreet's corps, and then the new one that hadn't been with the army before. That's one decision Lee made, and I think that decision in itself shows that he's Luis, that's almost one way to see how these guys will do. You're giving them not as, quite as much responsibility as Longstreet and Jackson had under the old organization. You've reorganized the army and reduced the amount of responsibility that each of your first tier of subordinates has. But it was a requirement to do West Point? To no, get it's not a requirement, but... The, the, um, the other um, um, side they had... Gen generals that were not... They had one. Yeah. One. Yeah. Corps commander. Dan Sickles <laughs> is the only corps commander in either army who didn't go to West Point. Right. And there was general, brigade, brigade general, and colonel. And there are lots of colonels. Lots of... Because there aren't enough West Pointers to command these gigantic armies. So the vast majority of officers in the armies did not go to West Point. But the top echelon of command in both armies overwhelming, in all the Civil War armies, overwhelmingly went to West Point. Sickles is the only one who didn't, and Sickles is sort of the odd man out in the army. A lot of the other officers don't like him. He's not part of the club <laughs> in the, any way. That didn't play for Lee also a problem to choosing officers high ranked because, oh, we have to be West Point at a no. certain year or class or he, whatever. He would have just, no, it's, uh, everybody he considered was a West Pointer. Everybody who was conceivably a candidate to be a corps commander and was a West. Do you think that that, that was uh, also like necessary, or he was too careful? No, I don't think there was anybody. If I were in Lee's, I wouldn't even know where. To, you'd have to go so far down to get somebody who wasn't a West Pointer. Mm -hmm. The idea of taking them from they might be a brigade commander. So you go from commanding fifteen hundred men to twenty thousand men. That's too. That's too big a jump to take. Too big a jump. At the very end of the war. There was a man named John Gordon, who you'll, you'll see where they'll talk about him at Gettysburg. The Marines will, I'm sure, when you're there. He ends up as a Corps commander at, the, at Appomattox. He's a Corps commander. He's a non-West Pointer who's just a kind of brilliant military figure. But he, it takes him a long time. And the only reason he gets up there is because everybody else is getting shot. And he ends up in that position. There's a pause here. Get, yes, do you want to start a new line? Yes, let's start a new thread. Um, I'm going to make another feeble attempt to get you to say something nice about Longstreet. I've said a lot of nice things about Longstreet. When I was he was very tall. When I was going through <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I was trying to find, when I was digging through my Longstreet books, was some, I remember reading at some point there was some study someone did that they actually tried to duplicate his march on the second day. And they said, and I want to know if you, I remember this, that he got to a point where he was exposed. So he had to backtrack and mm -hmm. then take the way around. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know? 
Yeah. Do you know yes. what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, I've made that. Can you tell me? I've taken that? many groups on that march. It's <coughs> yes, it's it's in, and Porter Alexander. He talks about it. He they, they wanted to get around to the Union left. And you, you come down a road, and I don't know whether the Marines, maybe they'll take you on this march too. You come up to this little piece of high ground, and you're looking at little round top. And round top. And there are Union signal men up there, and they don't want to be discovered. So when they see that, they drop back down off the ridge. And then he does this long counter march and gets down in the bottom. He's got a gap of about 500 yards. He needs to get from here to right down here without being seen. So he does this long. Well, Porter Alexander reached that same place earlier in the day where his artillery caught up, and oh, they saw that. What was his solution to the problem? He dropped down, went about 400 yards off to his right, and ended up down where he was supposed to be. It took him maybe 20 minutes to do it. 20 minutes. With how many guys? Well, he had all his artillery. The artillery was out in front of the infantry. It's not how many guys you have, it's how do you solve the problem. He solved the problem in a very efficient and direct way. Longstreet solved the problem in the most cumbersome imaginable way that ate up lots of precious time. And Alexander remarked, in another context, he didn't see why the infantry, when they got there, just didn't follow his horse droppings around to see how they got where they were going. Because it just, and when you stand there, the ground just lays out. The camera is a little round top. We're standing on this little road here. There's a, the ridge goes just like this. And we drop back this far, and we just come around, go around the back row, and we end up where the camera is. And nobody can see us. I mean, you can see it all from right there. Can see it all, so you've got to find another thing to get Longstreet off the hook. That one's not going to work. That one he should have been able to figure out. He did things. He he didn't start to get his column ready to march until his last brigade was up. And I, this is inside the Beltway minutia. But I mean, this is he waits for a for his very last brigade to get up before he starts to get ready to go. Why didn't he get ready to go? And when the last brigade comes up, go. But didn't he do that because he didn't agree with the orders? And he yes. Kind of yeah, what kind of subordinate does that because he doesn't agree with the orders? Yeah. I mean, really, if he really doesn't want to do it, then say, General Lee, I can't, I'm sorry, I, I disagree so vehemently with what you're doing that I think you should put someone else in my place. That's what you do if you're not going to try your best. That's what you do. Get out of the way. I hate the play you called, Peyton, so I'm only going to run at half speed. On this panel. I know the ball's going to come to me, but I'm not going to run very fast because I, I think you should have called a slam instead of a go. You don't get to do that if you're the receiver and Peyton Manning calls a play. Or, you won't, or I guarantee you, you won't be a receiver very long if you do that two or three times and he knows you're doing it. You don't get to do that in an army. And, and, I do, and I think you put your finger right on I think that's exactly what Longstreet was doing. He's making a point. But let's save him for next week. We'll talk about Longstreet a lot next week. We're supposed to focus on Meade and Lee, Jay. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm glad you affirmed what I thought we were doing tonight. I feel so empowered. Lee and Meade. But talking about Lee and just shit he going. Some time in that's a huge, that's what I had actually intended to start with tonight. But this is sort of stream of consciousness, the way we're coming at this. So now we're back in the aftermath of Chancellorsville. Right. Should he have even gone, what does Alan Nolan think about that? Well, he kind of displays the argument that, yeah, you know, they'll take it to the north, but it seems that it's too aggressive. It's like taking it to the Alan thinks it's a dumb idea. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. What should Lee have done, according to Alan? They should have just hunkered down and been on the defensive. But Hunker the down, baby, and just <coughs> let the Yankees come to you. Just like at Fredericksburg. Right. Well, I see the whole points we talked about last class, about going to the north, luring the army away from Richmond, you know, using your army to just dissipate, making the northerners have uh, a call for peace. But I feel like it's a huge bowl to die, and I don't see why the north, with so many more men, couldn't split their army and sack Richmond as well as engage Lee in, in Pennsylvania. Did they? Well, they just took him to Pennsylvania right there. I mean, but, but yes, but I they, mean, they left. They left away. What did Hooker want to do when Lee marched north? Take uh, he wanted to go to Richmond. <laughs> but they didn't. He didn't. But why did? I mean, Lee understands what are the realities? What, what would the northern mm -hmm. population say if General Lee's headed? for Pennsylvania, 
and the Army of the Potomac goes the other way. How is that going to play behind the lines in the United States? That is not, it is not an option. There's a, the biggest, most famous rebel army is in the United States. What's the reaction? You go get them and get them out of the United States. You don't get to go the other way. But don't they have enough men that they can do both? I mean, there's a, they're, they're How many armies do they have next to Washington? One. One. They have the Army of the Potomac. Right. What's the Army of the Potomac's job? Deal with the Army of Northern Virginia. Where the Army of Northern Virginia goes, the Army of the Potomac, goddamn better well go, or there are going to be problems. There are going to be tremendous problems for the Lincoln administration. So that is not an option to go the other way. Not an option. And Lee understood that. Even though Hooker, having been crushed mentally by Lee at Chancellorsville, wanted to do that. I still find that sort of hilarious. The, the Army commander would say, well, I want to go the other way. I know he's headed to the United States, now it's my perfect chance to go to Richmond. What he didn't understand is Richmond is not the key. The key is Lee's army. So if you think he sacked Richmond, Lee would have just gone on terrorizing Pennsylvania throughout, I mean... I think there was no there. chance he was going to sack Richmond. There's a zero percent chance that politically he would be allowed to do that. There's absolutely no chance, not a slim chance, no chance that he's going to be allowed to do that. These are two... Democratic republics at war. This is one of the things we talked about the first day. Politics and military affairs are like this. The military, the armies do not operate in a military vacuum. They operate in an intensely politicized atmosphere. And people pay attention. People being civilians at home who vote, pay attention. Uh, Chase, I'll be right back there in just a second. Oh, sorry. Because last class you said that uh, he had to, to take the army out of Virginia. He said that, yes. Lee did. Yeah, so how would else he do that without going to... No, that's the only way he can do that. We so haven't talked about the main he... reason he said he wanted to get it out of Virginia. What's the main reason Lee wants to get the army out of Virginia? Yeah, didn't he want to give them a chance to regrow their crops? It's logistics. Yeah. He wants to give the farmers in Virginia a respite and he wants to get into Pennsylvania and just siphon everything his army can use out of that lush Pennsylvania countryside. That's, I mean, that's the number one thing on his mind. Number two is he says, you're talking about how big the armies are, what is he, what's his, he says if we don't, if we just sit and wait, what is going to happen? We say, okay, we won the Battle of Chancellorsville, I'm just going to sit here at Fredericksburg, what's going to happen? People are going to want to leave the army. They're going to get What's going to happen, what are the Federals going to do? Hmm? What are the Federals going to do in, from Lee's perspective? What does he say? What's the scenario that he sketches out? Basically, he sees a war of attrition with the North continuing to engage and bring the war to the South, one damaging the crop. Wherever they choose to bring it. He says they're bigger than we are. They have more men than we have. If we just sit here, we're going to allow our more powerful opponent to take their time, perfect their plans, and project their power at the point of their choice. And eventually, where does he say the Army in Northern Virginia will end up? It, it'll end up defending Richmond. It'll end up in Richmond. And when he gets in Richmond, his view is the war is over because it will end up as a siege, and a siege can only end one way, with a smaller force hunkered down and a larger force enveloping it. And he will do almost anything to avoid that. But the book makes the comparison between Lee and Washington, which mm -hmm. I thought was pretty interesting. Yes. Washington, and Washington's Lee's idol. Right. Washington lets the British take New York. He lets them take Boston. He lets them have anything they want. We didn't so, exactly let them take New York. <laughs> they <laughs> took New York and threw sure. him out. But yes. <laughs> but so Lee moving into Pennsylvania is basically the same as Washington going to Valley Forge and just kind of making his way down south and having to catch Cornwallis at Yorktown. So from that point, perspective, the war of attrition isn't a bad thing for Lee. Lee does not fight the war the way Washington fought the revolution. He absolutely, Washington avoids big battles. But when Lee is afraid of this war of attrition, should he have been? He's afraid of being besieged in Richmond. Yeah, he absolutely should have been. What, how did the war end? When he got besieged in Richmond in Petersburg. That's when the war ended. Yeah, but like politically, the North was going to get tired of this if Lee had avoided the big battle. Is that fair to say? 
if there weren't big battles, the United States civilian population probably wouldn't have gotten tired of it as quickly as they got tired of it when their soldiers were suffering hideous casualties in these big battles. It's a, it, it's a, it, it's this race for the Confederates from Lee's perspective, a race between attrition that comes with winning the kinds of victories you're winning that depress Northern morale. And how quickly northern morale, which is going to have, the, is the north going to give up first or are we going to run out of men first? That is the equation that Lee has in his mind. And in the end, the northern morale proved resilient enough to absorb a third of a million casualties and still push on through, although it came very close in the summer of 64 not to sticking to it. I mean, this close, this close. You can, you can make a great case that it would have been better if Lee hadn't suffered so many casualties. I mean, you'd have to be a nitwit not to make that case. But what you can't supply and what Alan Nolan could never answer, I would ask him, how do you guarantee a supply of Ambrose Burnsides to give you a bunch of battles of Fredericksburg where you put your army in really strong ground and your opponent comes up and just attacks uphill against you all day? You, 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 they only ever found one of those guys in command of the Union Army. Yeah. Exactly, but if you know that that is what caused the Union at that moment the battle, why did you do the same in the opposite way? Because they were the whole day fighting uphill, attacking a very entrenched position, they were going to lose, and Lee should know that beforehand, right? What, we're, what you're saying, Manuel, is that he should have known that he would fail at Gettysburg. And he should have known that attacking an entrenched position uphill at that moment is most of the time going to be a failure. Here's the problem with that thinking. He did that at Gaines's Mill in <coughs> late June 18. He had a 50,000 man assault at Gaines's Mill, biggest assault of the war for Lee, that succeeded. He had assaults at Chancellorsville exactly two months before the Pickett Pettigrew assault, where his infantry who were outnumbered were attacking Federals who were entrenched and they succeeded. There are, uh, and I think this is what led him, I'm not getting, I'm just trying to explain why I think he did this and it's because I think he believed in the end that his infantry could just take care of business no matter what the obstacles because he had seen them do it in an offensive mode four times before Gettysburg. But when you stand there and look across, you'll stand on Seminary Ridge and look across at Cemetery Ridge and I mean you I'm sure you'll think, gosh, we're gonna line up here and walk over there with people it's seven tenths of a mile with people shooting at us with cannons and my, ooh, ooh. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's really distressing to do that. So should he have, I mean, he had this great quotation later. He said, if I had known that it wouldn't work, even as dull a fellow as I am would have done something different. But he didn't know it wouldn't work. Longstreet thought it wouldn't work. And I think Longstreet, Jim, for all your posturing about how I don't like Longstreet, I think Longstreet's idea was better at Gettysburg. I think Porter Alexander's idea is the best. What did he say Lee should have done after his big victory on the first day? Alexander says there are three options, and he says the best one is what? For the Confederates. Defend. Yes, hunker down. We 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 smacked the Federals around on the first day. They're they're on this line here. Here we are on Seminary Ridge, which is a nice defensive position as well. Just we'll hunker down and make them attack us. They never drive us from positions. Said, and, and Alexander said, the onus is on them to get us out of the United States. The, the place where Lee was most disingenuous in his official report is when he said that he, the battle was forced on him because his supply situation was tenuous and in essence he had to attack. That, that is just not true. And Alexander calls him on that. He said, well, we stayed there for three more days and fought a big battle and then we stayed another ten days north of the Potomac. Uh, if he had published that book, if Alexander had when he wrote it, he would have come in for incredible criticism across the South. Incredible. For being so harsh on Lee. Anybody want to do something else with Lee right now, or should we give... This, this class is no different than any other class, where it's all about Lee. We haven't spent much time on George Meade yet.
but any kind of Lee aftershocks. No, see, I've, I've, I've made the answer to that no, but we'll, we, might, we might circle back to Lee. Mead. We've had a semi-eloquent defense of Lee as someone who was who did a very good job in difficult circumstances. I want to hear someone offer a critique of Mead that might not be quite so positive if anyone reached that kind of conclusion about him. Or are you all Meadites in here? <laughs> Have a crack at it, Jim. Yes, that's good. Um, the essay de basically defending me um, and saying that he really was a critical player in this um, seemed to me to be mostly about how he avoided getting <coughs> shot and moved despite the fact that his uh, headquarters was blown up. And it was. You'll see his, it wasn't blown up, but there were lots of cannonballs coming around it, and so he left. So the, the, the entire narrative of his sort of actions during the day seemed like he wasn't really contributing that much. The, the biggest effect <coughs> I saw that came out about him was that he, yes, he did make deci that one decision early on, uh, brought everyone together to get information and drive a consensus, but ultimately made the decision. But everything <coughs> else seemed to just fall into place because of either the division commanders um, or his, his uh, subordinates did their jobs well, or just kind of happened to work. When did he get to the battlefield? When does Meade show up at Gettysburg? The night of day one. The night of day one. How, how late on the night of day one? <coughs> really late. Dark, midnight or almost midnight. Yeah. So almost midnight. So that's, everything's over with. He has to make a decision that night, too. I mean, he, there he has a decision to make. Am I going to stay here tomorrow or not? What about on the second? What are his biggest, what, what's his biggest crisis on the second? Sickles. Sickles, yes. What's, what, so what's the deal <coughs> with Sickles? You're George Gordon Meade. What do you think is happening on your line on the second until you find out differently? You've put your line together how? Are you thinking, what the hell are you doing? Well, no, now wait a minute. I said, what are you thinking before you find out what Sickles is doing? What, how have you put your line together? In a nice interior line, on high ground. You don't, probably don't even... That's right. It goes from, it goes from cult tail. This is such a mess here now. We're going to start over. You think you're doing a we have all these boards here, which I love. This is great. We have boards and boards. Cult tail, Cemetery Hill, which confusingly has the same... <laughs> Initials, <laughs> cemetery ranch. <laughs> There's little round top. So you, you think you have a West Point case study there? How That's to do the offensive line. So his original line on the second goes like this, and Sickles is supposed to be in the farthest left. It kind of goes down to little round top. That's what he thinks is is happening. And then early in the afternoon, what does he find out has happened? <coughs> What, what has Sickles done? It's out on the peach orchard. Here's the peach orchard, which is higher. So Sickles has just taken his, his core. This is the Emmitsburg Road coming into town. He's taken his core, and he's put it, one division there. And then the other one, my map is so bad, it comes down to Devil's Den, which you will see. And he didn't, what did he tell me about this? Nothing. <laughs> did not tell me he did this. So now the Union line just stops right here. And what's the weakness of Sickles? And Sickles, the point is that this is higher than this ground. And Sickles is sensitive about that because of what happened to him at Chancellorsville. And when you go there, you'll see that the peach orchard is higher than this. But when he moves out there, what is the defensive problem with his being out there along the Emmitsburg Road? You, you can just get cut off. This flank is in the air. This flank is in the air. He's just floating out there all by himself with his 10,000 men. And so Meade's, what's Meade's reaction to this? What are his possible reactions to this? What could he do when he finds out this has happened? I don't mean he cursed. He cursed a lot. <laughs> Meade, Meade had a very rich vocabulary of uh, <laughs> vulgarisms and blasphemies that he would deploy at the drop of a hat. But apart from that, 
what what are the what what could he do here? Okay, darn it, Sickles has gone out there. Golly, <laughs> no. Oh fudge, he's not where he's supposed to be. Didn't he try to order him to come back? He, he thought about, out. but yeah, he went out and looked. Right. Why yeah. can't he order him back? Because they started fighting. Because right? the Confederates are showing up. Right. <laughs> That's right. The Confederates are showing up. So. He so choice but the full aid reinforcements to try and help out the situation. Yes, he does. He pulls in troops from two other corps to try to shore up this this weak line. And somebody made the semi-dismissive comment, Justin. I don't know who did that. What me did was move people around, and he gets a lot of points for that. That is essentially what he does, is move people around. He moves them around so that his line <coughs> is strongest at the point of greatest danger. He moves them from, he virtually strips everybody from our far right CH site and moves them down here so there's hardly anybody left up there. And he moves other people. It's all about supporting his left flank, which is in real danger. Um, throughout the fighting on the second. And he uses these interior lines very well. So he does a good, he does a very good job of that. But that would be something, you'd have to be a really bad officer not to know how to use interior lines because that's one of the things that everybody knew. I mean, that's a huge advantage everybody knew. But, he's, but still, let's give him points for that. He did a good job of that. What else? did he do that we find especially uh, impressive? I was going to ask, I mean, I could never understand why Sickles went. Why did Sickles go out there? I could not. Michelle wants to know why I have chalk all over my pants and why Sickles went out from his line on Cemetery Ridge. Why did he do that? And somebody, but not you, Jim. I don't want you to answer this. I want somebody else to answer. Chad. <laughs> Chancellor Bill, he had a higher position, but was ordered to give it up. It's called Hazel Grove, yes. And, uh, and what happened when he gave it up? Bad things. The, the United yes. States <laughs> lost the battle. That's, that's right. Other than that, nothing bad happened. But <laughs> so, so it's all about Chancellorsville. It's all about Chancellorsville. What is, I mean, he, he just says, and he told Henry Hunt, who's the Union artillerist, our chief of artillery, I can defend better from that high ground than I can from back here. Mm -hmm. But the fallacy in that, he doesn't have enough men to make a line that makes sense by going out to the Peach Orchard and defending that high ground. So that's a good argument in theory, but on the ground, it doesn't stand up. All those sickles defended, and sickles said, what did he say his move did? Retrospective, but when they're arguing about who's, his argument was what? <coughs> Did it cause me to send reinforcements sooner, which was kind of, again, fortuitous. But what did it do with the Confederates, according to Sickles? Anybody pick up on that, Jeff? I think it, like, saved the Union line because the Confederates yes. would have gotten around their flank because they weren't on either of the round tops. So the Confederates instead attacked him out in the peach orchard. And that gave, it's almost like a delaying action. It made them focus there, and they broke a lot of their strength trying to carry this ground that Sickles took up. And by the time they overran the Peach Orchard and the wheat field, they ran up against Union lines that by that point were able to hold on the high ground. So he argues it saved the battle. And his critics said it came this close to undoing the army, you idiot, you, you <laughs> political craven, political, Tammany Hall tool. You almost <laughs> lost the battle by what you did. And his response is, no, that's exactly wrong. By moving out there, I made Longstreet deploy farther away than he would have, and he broke himself on my line, which was farther to the west than it would have been otherwise. Yes? So I wonder if part of, I wonder if part of this is because the two didn't get along. So I remember saying, that Sickles was in Hooker's faction. He was. And, and no one else was. Hancock, right? Yes. And so there was already a lot of bad baggage to begin with. And so there was no trust, there was no respect. Um, and so I don't, I wonder if Sickle would have made the same decision to disobey the orders had they actually gotten along. If he regardless, and Meade had gotten along? Right, regardless of chance. Or if Hooker had given him the orders. Or someone that he got along with had given the orders. I think that. I think there's no way we can let him off the hook for not 
telling his army commander what he was doing. I mean, you just can't do that. You can't move an entire infantry corps out of where you're ordered to be without letting your commander know what you're doing. So I don't think we can let him off the hook there. But I do think he is, it's, it's understandable because he is an almost complete outsider in the high command. But not only because he got along with Hooker, who was a West Pointer, but because he is, he's a politician, he's not a West Pointer, he has this very clouded and controversial and notorious history that he brought with him as well, and was not considered a gentleman and was not coming, I mean, he just doesn't fit in, he doesn't fit in at all with this, in the culture of the Army of the Potomac. But even saying all of that, he's still a soldier and a subordinate, and you, he just can't do that. Even if it's the right move, if he had told Meade initially, then Meade could have said, okay, you go there and we'll do this and this and this as we set up the line. The Marines, I'm sure, are going to talk to you about that line. The line in a number of places that Hooker, that Sickles put together, didn't have enough infantry to make an infantry line. There are lots of places where he only had <coughs> artillery. And in the Civil War, you can't have artillery all by itself. It, it can't be by itself because it's absolutely vulnerable to infantry if it's all by itself. So his, it was a terrible line. He didn't have enough men to do that. It's, on the other hand, it took the Confederates a lot of casualties to get through Sickles' line. So, and it's impossible to decide which of them is absolutely right or absolutely wrong. But I don't think it's impossible to decide that he, you can't have a principal subordinate who is freelances this way in a situation like that. But, I'm, I, but I want somebody to argue with me if you think that, that if there are circumstances when you should have a subordinate do that. When it makes sense, now, right? That, Four hands went up. Let's go. Isn't that the way that Lee kind of ran things, right? I mean, to a certain extent, certainly not to, to the point of insubordination, but no. didn't, he, didn't he push down certain decision-making power and say, if you get to a point in the battle and I'm not there and there's a decision to be made, you make it and you become the aggressor. Absolutely. And so it seems like if Sickles had been in Lee's army, Lee might have almost praised him for, for taking that kind of an in initiative. I mean, at what point is it insubordination and at what point is it just taking the initiative and taking higher ground that you see is better? It's the, the problem with taking the higher ground. I think, I think that's a great way to put it, and I think there would be much more leeway in Lee's army than in the Union army to do that. But the problem with the action is that he doesn't improve the army's situation there. He creates this salient where he, his whole corps is now completely vulnerable. And unless people do other things to rectify that situation, he's, he's put at risk basically a fifth of the army here. So I think that's his problem. It's, it's not as if he's pushing an aggressive, he's not going after the Confederates here, he's just changing <coughs> the defensive alignment. But I think your point about whether this kind of behavior, at least to a degree, would be more acceptable in Lee's army, I think the answer is yes to that. How can you explain Hood then? Lee had let Longstreet or Hood go around the flank well, in this exact same Lee, Lee's not part of that equation. That's Longstreet being a bad subordinate again, in my view. Hood should have been allowed to do that. Lee would have allowed Hood to do that because <coughs> Lee had allowed Longstreet to do that at Manassas. He had allowed Jackson to do it at Chancellorsville. You get to the ground and you see that the situation is different and you know something that I don't know, then you're allowed to adjust the circumstances on the ground. And that's what Hood was asking to do. And it's Longstreet who said, no, General Lee told us to do it this way, and we can't change General Lee's orders. Well, Longstreet knew that wasn't true, because yeah. Longstreet had changed Lee's orders at different yeah. points. Because you put all of that on Longstreet, none of that I put 100% of that on Longstreet, because Lee is way back up by Lee, has no idea what's going on. And they're not communicating with Lee. Longstreet is just saying Lee would not allow that, and so we can't do that. Getting back to, to Meade, so if part of war is kind of imposing your will on the enemy. Was there ever a time that, that Meade attempted to do that? Because I feel like he was just reacting in large part. This is all reactive, yes. Right, and, and so you know, he's been maneuvering. <coughs> that brings us to the next Meade question. And Mary, I saw your hand go up. I'll come here in just a minute. What, where is Meade's opportunity to impose his will on the Army of Northern Virginia? Does he have any option? 
as, as he's watching the detritus of the Pettigrew assault in front of him, it seems, and when he has the Sixth Corps right behind him, which is the biggest corps in the Army of the Potomac and it hasn't fought yet, it seems like there's an option there for him to do something. I saw other hands go up too. Is that what everyone was going to say? Now what's the counter argument to that? Why, what would prevent his doing that? Give us some factors. It's late. Brian, it's late. Is it almost dark? What time does it get dark in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania in July of 1863? What isn't there in the summer of 1863? There isn't daylight savings time. It gets dark around 8. By 8 o'clock, it's pretty dark. <laughs> So imagine you're in Arizona, and that's what time is like in Pennsylvania. What, and what time in the afternoon is Pickett's charge over with? About four. We've got four hours of daylight left. Now that's either a lot of time or not much time to move 15,000 men around and get them to do something. It takes a long time to move a lot of men around and get them in position to do something. Why else might he not have done anything here? So maybe they need to regroup because of all the casualties that they've been yeah. in. And yeah. The men need to. The tone of your voice is so. You're, I mean, your heart is not in that. <coughs> and another thing, maybe this and that. And you know, I might have said you that. You could make that argument. You could make it. Yeah. <laughs> it seems like after a victory, like you want to sort of chase it, chase it through. Put yourself in Meade's skin. What's going through your head right now? They're retreating. I'm sorry, go ahead, Kara, make your point before. Well, I thought he also, or I, my impression from the reading was that they, he was still worried that the Confederates might re regroup and that they weren't done. Mm -hmm. And he had seen so much success letting them mess up on their own behalf that I, I think that probably gave him a cautious... So, so just hang on the defense even, let them attack again. Right. Scott? Well, the, um, I, if I was him, I would have felt like we, we won this battle, and I don't want to risk anything more. You would have exhaled and thought, wow. But the, the, the big argument in, in, in the essay, I believe, is that like in all this repositioning, everything, every other chorus had gotten like so mixed up, and everything was just kind of, they were in this defensive position, and it was all patchwork. And, to and leave, Hancock like, it, was wounded, and yeah, three, 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 three corps commanders, yep. I think it said, yep. had all been badly wounded. and. Um, to try to regroup and get people where they needed to be for the lead a charge would have been very difficult. difficult. And I think to your point about Meade, he's really new on the scene. This is his first huge battle. He's in charge of the entire army to see success and then say, okay, and now I'm going to go and I'm going to chase after the Confederates. For, and the, you know, looking at his leadership styles and stuff, it seems like that would be a bit of a stretch for him, at least at this point. Yeah. I personally think that's a lot of what's going on. But just flip this, the scenarios, though. Can, can you imagine that Lee would let an opportunity like that go by? I, I really can't imagine that. I think he would have put something together and tried to do something to, because it, it's chaotic. I mean, it, wait, how many of you have been, I can't remember, I know I asked you, how many of you have been to Gettysburg? How many of you have stood on Cemetery Ridge and looked? I mean, you know what that vista is like from there, and to see nothing but defeat and chaos on the part of your opponent. As far as you can see in both directions in front of your line, I mean, that is something... Um, Porter Alexander, he talks about the Union <coughs> experience at Chancellorsville when they started to retreat from the clearing at Chancellorsville, and Alexander hurried his guns, his battalions of artillery, down into position to where they could fire into this, as he put it, defenseless mass of retreating men. He said, that's the part of a battle that can be denominated pie. That's what you wait for, that's what you dream of, and then you just inflict the greatest possible damage at that point. And that's not happening in the wake of the picket pettigrew assault. It's not at all. What about over the next several days? What, what happens over the next, what, what is Lee, what day does Lee retreat? The 4th. Same day Vicksburg surrenders. 
God is on the side of the United States is what the people in the United States decide. It's the 4th of July, and we've won two big victories. So Lee heads for the Potomac. What does he find? He's retreating in this gigantic rainstorm. The river's up, and he can't get across. How many days before he can get across? <coughs> Ten. Ten days he can't get across. And how much fighting takes place in those ten days? None. None. Scott? But, but that's probably good for the Union because at least the way that Alexander described it, they've become so entrenched in a defensive position, even though that their backs are to the river and to the wall, that they were like hoping for a battle at that point. They were. They were. I'll just ask you to flip this around again. The Federals are hunkered down along the Potomac. There are about 45,000 of them. And there are 80,000 Confederates who are coming after them, and they want the Confederates to attack I think the I think I, it's just it's just an interesting contrast in mindsets or cultures of command or whatever you want to call it. It's a very striking contrast. It really is. Um, it's I mean Lee is encumbered by these huge trains of wounded men. Um, trains wagon trains they call them trains. His trains stretch total supplies. Uh, and wounded, he has more than 40 miles of trains on different roads heading for the Potomac. 40 miles as he leaves the battlefield. That seems like a pretty vulnerable target. Yeah, I, I'm shocked. Just, even if the unions had, <clears throat> had kind of surrounded them or in, in just lightly engaged, you could have kept them from crossing. They the can't region. cross if they're engaged. Right. Yeah. And, they, and not even press an all-out attack, but just continue no. to harass yep. and then... Yep. Have fun with that. Yeah, but they can't cross if they're under fire. Right. And in the yeah. end, Lee gets across in one night. He crosses his army in one night. He did the same thing after Antietam. One night. That's incredibly efficient, going across the Potomac there. It's, um, I, I, think, I think Meade is in a really hard position and does a really good job in a lot of ways. But I can understand Lincoln's frustration in the wake of Gettysburg. I really can. Mario? We talked about the leadership style difference between Meade and Lee, which really gets to the point here, but if Meade was so big on um, consens consensus gaining and relying upon the counsel of his um, fellow officers, I didn't get the sense that there was any big voice propelling him on. There's you know, not. Sort of providing a check to there's, his timidity. There's, there's not. There's no one saying, you must, you've got to, let me do this, just let me go, even if no one else goes, let me, no. So, I think we not then just focus in on sort of Meade's timidness and sort of try to look at what else is going on with the management of his career? I think it's cultural. I think it's, I think that the whole reaction on the part of these union officers is part of this McClellan culture that, that was so profoundly important in the forging of the army and it's absolutely and McClellan's absence makes no difference and is still there even though McClellan isn't there anymore and his most aggressive corps commander is Hancock and Hancock is is wound, is really badly wounded and and Reynolds the, his most senior corps commander is dead so not that he was that aggressive, but uh, that may be part of it. So you've got new people in command of those corps, too, just as Ewell is new, and who knows what he's going to do. Now you have new people in command, and Sickles. So there's somebody new in command of the third corps, in command of the first corps, in co I mean, it's in command of the second corps. But the sixth corps hadn't even fought. It's the biggest one in the army. It seems like the sixth corps would have been available for at least light harassing duty. <laughs> something, something. <clears throat> Scott? As another kind of <clears throat> positive on me, one of the things that I saw is a contrast, and it may just because, <clears throat> may have just been because of the situation, was when the Federals were under uh, fire and, and, you know, he was taking, his headquarters were taking uh, fire, 
he still like got out there and went and like checked in with all the commanders yeah, and what I mean they have the good story about the he tells a story about the um, guy hip standing behind the wagon and how it didn't give any more protection yeah whereas it seems like Lee at least in this situation is very removed from any of the actual combat and I don't know I saw that as something that was kind of an act of valor um, to still be out there in the trenches when uh, he's at risk. Right. Well, he he definitely is moving around the battlefield. He Lee acted that way at Antietam, moving all over the line and coming under fire. I think Lee, Lee pretty much stayed close to where the Virginia Monument is now. When you're there, you'll have a good sense of where he was. And he was in just sort of, yeah, listening to fighting to his left, fighting to his right. And he's not moving all around. Nope. Nope. I'm not sure what his presence, his presence down where Hood and Longstreet were, would have made a difference, I think. Because I'm, I have no doubt Lee would have said, well, sure, move around there. That makes sense. You can get clear around the flank that way. But anyway, Hood didn't get to go, and then Hood got shot. Almost immediately. Hideous wound. Very bad wound for old Hood. Nobody's gotten a Meade tattoo, I guess, since we met last time, <laughs> not a single one. I think Meade, but it, I, I'm also, I have a, a real sense you're much more interested in Lee here. He seems more interesting to you. Why is that? Why is he more interesting to you? I think it's just the length of his <laughs> perceived, uh, or maybe not even perceived, but his role in the Civil War. And I think, so going back to sort of why he became in the first place, I don't want to take us back, but I know take us back. In, in Alexander's <laughs> account, he was even proffering an option to go to Tennessee, and I think Longstreet Longstreet want, Longstreet wanted to, to do yeah, that. yeah. Um, so <coughs> the whole, I mean, Lee was the impetus for this entire thing. Oh no, no, absolutely, and it's it's a question. It it underscores how important he was because virtually everybody else we talked about this. I think we did. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure we did. They debated this in April and May, the Confederates, how to allocate their resources. And most people, politicians, generals, and Jefferson Davis, favored weakening Lee and reinforcing either the army defending Vicksburg or Braxton Bragg's army, which was essentially defending Chattanooga. And they made good arguments, and, but Lee said no. And in the end, Davis wouldn't go against Lee, which is a measure of uh, the argument in Alan Nolan's, or in, uh, in the two books that you are looking at by Tom Connolly that argue that Lee was just one of many generals. He's just the same as all the others. He's not the same as all the others. He, they get five votes and he gets five and a half votes in this. It's like Lincoln, when he took, when he polled his cabinet and everybody voted no and he voted yes and then he said the eyes have it. It's that kind of thing uh, with Lee. It's hard to go against the only guy who ever wins anything. For you. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to do. Carrie, you had your hand up. If we move so far, you don't remember what you were going to say? Well, I, I think it's interesting that we find Lee, Lee's definitely, maybe it's because I feel like we've read a lot more about him, but at the end of the day, I'd rather be me with the right strategy than charismatic, slightly dogmatic, and Lee with the wrong strategy. So it, it's just really interesting to think that me, because he didn't go on the offensive to be more like Lee, is harshly criticized, and Lee, who basically loses the war because he will not do anything but be the aggressor, is still... Now you're channeling Alan Nolan, that's right. Lee loses <laughs> the war because he's too aggressive. You could also say that Meade's not... You don't have to say Meade's not being more like Lee. You could also say he's not being more like Grant, right. who also would have done something to hurt the rebels after... I mean, Grant would have been all over them, too. Meade does empower people. Though, right? Like he just empowers the top level at the decision making point and then expects people to listen. Well, by empower, you mean he listens to their okay. arguments and then makes it, yes, yeah, sure, yeah, he does, he does. Yep. Well, I, I was going to say that I think, you know, you look at the two people that from the war that are still have these huge legacies are Lincoln and Lee, and I think that the reason is that they had this perceived or publicly perceived ideology that they were operating behind, and I think that's what people like find fascinating that they were so, like you know, there's a, this lore of Lee being driven by his like love for home, 
and Lincoln being driven by, you know, his like love of country or however, however you you know as a whole nation. And so I think that people find that fascinating that they were so driven by that 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 it like dictated all of their actions and impacted the way that they. And so I think that's why that you know there ends up being this long term fascination. Whereas Meade like did the right things, but it's like there's not a backstory there. And I think it's harder to like connect with why he did the things he did. And, and with Lee, it's also, I think, I mean, if you, all of Lee's qualities that people liked would have meant nothing if he hadn't won a bunch of victories in 1862 and 1863. It wouldn't have mattered. Oh, he's a great Christian gentleman. Yeah, but he's a loser. He's lost all these battles. I don't care. Let him, let him be a preacher, not a general, because he's not winning battles. That's the key. That's the real key to Lee, is that he wins battles and gives civilians hope. That's the key. It's, all the other stuff is nice. Wonderful dressing and gigas and scroll work and uh, crown moldings, but the, but the the basic thing is that he's successful and successful to the degree that Gettysburg isn't held against him. That's what to me is one of the most remarkable aspects of his position in the Confederacy. Gettysburg essentially has no impact on his reputation. None. None. It's amazing, uh, but true. Amazing, but true. Uh, it really is. Okay, we're a minute over. We'll do subordinates next week. I'm going to bring a musket next week. I have to drive to Washington, or I would have brought it tonight. And who knows in Washington with a musket what might happen to me? But I will have it next week when we end. Wait, I already gave you hardtack, didn't I? No. I didn't bring hardtack? No. You'll get hardtack too. Hardtack and a muscle. <laughs> You'll be the only kids on your block with hardtack, I promise.